Hi everybody, in this video I'm going to go over Apex Section 7.1.3, which goes over properties of solids. So this is sort of a different sort of unit because it talks about all different properties of solids. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the four different major types of solids and some of their properties, and then we're going to go into some definitions that you need to know about properties of solids. Okay, so our first one is metallic solids. An example of this would be the element silver, like a silver ring or some sort of silver material. And when we have a metallic bond, what happens is, is we have these nuclei, right? These positive represent the nuclei. And usually we would then have our electrons sort of just around each individual nucleus, right? However, for metallic bonds, that's not the case. So for metallic bonds, we have our two nuclei, and the electrons are not actually bound any particular nucleus. So they're just sort of floating around between all of the nuclei. And they can move freely however they want, okay? So we say that these nuclei are set, and then it's surrounded by sort of like an ocean or a sea of moving electrons, okay? And this is how a metallic bond looks like. So the force that holds together a metallic solid is a metallic bond. The structural unit for a metallic bond is an atom. Now, the structural unit is the smallest piece of that type of solid. So the smallest piece of a metallic solid is an atom, okay? And some special properties of metallic solids is because we have these free moving electrons that are not bound to a particular nucleus, that means that metallic solids can be really good conductors of heat and electricity because these electrons can move freely. So this is metallic solids. Next one we want to talk about is ionic solids, and this is something you're already familiar with. An example would be salt, sodium chloride. So in sodium chloride, we would have our sodium ions, right, positive one, and then we would have our chlorine ions, which are negative, okay? And they would be together, so the positives are next to the negatives. And we already know that the force that holds together an ionic solid is this electrostatic interaction, that attraction between the positive and the negative, and we call that an ionic bond. The smallest unit of an ionic solid is an ion, right? That one Cl is one ion right there. And some special properties of ionic solids, which you already know, is that it is made up of a metal cation with a non-metal anion. So that's how you can identify this. In sodium chloride, we know sodium is a metal. We know chlorine is a non-metal. So we know this is a metallic, um, this is an ionic solid, okay? Moving on to the next, we have molecular solids. Molecular solids are something like water. So let me try and explain this a little more clearly to us here. So this is our water molecule. And it has hydrogen, hydrogen. So within our water molecule itself, this is a covalent bond. But if you have solid water like ice, the thing that's holding all of the water molecules together is not a covalent bond. It's actually going to be this intermolecular force, right? And this, in this case of water is hydrogen bonding. So the force that actually is holding together this molecular solid is an intermolecular force. The smallest unit of this molecular solid is this one molecule of water, okay? So since molecular solids are held together by intermolecular forces, intermolecular forces are weaker than other bonds, and that means molecular solids have lower melting points than other types of solids. All right, our last type of solid is called a network solid. This one is totally new. So an example of this would be diamond or graphite, and you can see these structures here. In these structures, what you have 
is you have an intermolecular force here, but most of the bonds are held together by covalent bonds, okay? That is especially the case in diamond. All of these solid lines are covalent bonds. And we remember that in covalent bonds, we're sharing electrons. So that makes it a really strong bond. So the force that holds together the network solid is a covalent bond. Each of these atoms is covalently bonded to the other atoms. Now, this is different than our molecular solid. Molecular solid, remember, it has the covalent bond within one molecule, but then the molecules are only held together weakly by intermolecular forces. In network solids, it's all held together by covalent bonds. That makes it really, really strong. So the force holding it together is covalent bonds. The smallest structural unit is one atom, right? That would be an atom. And since covalent bonds are stronger than other types of bonds, it means that network solids have very high melting points. So that's a property we want to know. All right, so those are our four types of solids. Now I wanna go through some other things you need to know. So crystalline and amorphous solids. So a solid that has a regular repeating crystal structure is called a crystalline solid. A crystal structure is just the way that the atoms are arranged, okay? So if you had a very regular structure, like just a sort of square like this, this would be an example of a crystalline solid, okay? Because it has a regular structure. And when they break, they would break along this very clean straight line. An example of this would be something like diamond or graphite. You could also have a solid that does not have a repeating pattern like this. It could just sort of be irregular, right? If we have something like this, and then over here it looks like this, and over here it's like this. Just something that's random, does not have a regular repeating pattern, that would be an amorphous solid. When an amorphous solid breaks, it would shatter into these weird irregular shapes. So an example of this would be glass. When you break a piece of glass, you don't get, you can't predict what the shards are going to look like, right? They have these random patterns. So that's an example of an amorphous solid. Okay, speaking of how solids break, there are three different ways that solids can react when they are, have a force exerted on them. And the first one is, is that they could be malleable. Malleable is how bendable a solid is. So a malleable solid could be hammered flat into a sheet, okay? If you had a piece of uh, solid and you hit it with a hammer, it would flatten out and not break. That's called malleable. Ductile is the ability to be stretched out without breaking. So if you have a ductile solid, you can pull on the edges and you can pull it all the way out into a wire and it will not break. Now, sort of the opposite of that is brittle. If something is brittle, it breaks very easily when a force is applied. And again, that would be an example of glass, okay? Another thing we wanna know is what an alloy is. So, an alloy is a mixture of two elements together in a solid state. They have properties of metals, and they're made to improve the properties of a solid. So for example, steel is a mixture of iron and carbon, right? So scientists wanted to have some of the properties of iron and some of the properties of carbon, right? Like they want iron is very strong, carbon is very lightweight. And so they create an alloy where they mix those two elements together and then that's how we create steel, okay? And the very last thing I want you to know about solids is what a superconductor and a semiconductor is. So we know that conductors are something that can carry electrical current or heat through it. A superconductor is a conductor that is just really, really good at this. It can conduct electricity extremely well. So well that, in fact, they can produce a magnetic field because of that electrical current going through it. And that would cause a magnet to be able to float above a superconductor. So there's a lot of research into superconductors going on right now. There's also semiconductors. Semiconductors are a material, a solid that sometimes is conductive. It has partial conductivity. That means that it, under certain situations, it is conductive, it will conduct electricity, and under other situations, it does not conduct electricity. 
And these are very useful in technology. Okay, so that's everything I want you to know about solids. This is sort of a um, random list of things that we need to know about solids, but we need to know about those four types of solids and their properties, as well as these a couple additional vocabulary parts. Thank you very much.